Hello. In this video, I will flesh out what I think is the most significant feature of the British Constitution, and that is not that it is unwritten or uncodified, but that it is unstructured. What I mean by structure is a worked out framework of law that establishes how our institutions relate to one another and what role they have within the overall functioning of the state. Now, our constitution does have well worked out theories of the powers of different institutions. We know fairly well what are the powers of the House of Lords, both as a matter of law and convention, and considering legislation sent to it by the House of Commons. But our constitution doesn't give a coherent, agreed upon account of the purposes of different institutions. Take the House of Lords, for example, the upper chamber of our parliament, which is composed of a mix of appointed and hereditary peers and the senior bishops of the Church of England. Why does the House of Lords exist in the first place? Why is it composed as it is? What role does it play and why is it the House of Lords and not some other body that performs this role? Most importantly, how does the role and functions of the House of Lords relate to those of other bodies upon which the Constitution touches? To the extent that any account of these institutional roles and the relationship between the House of Lords and other bodies can be found within our constitutional law, it is likely to be partial at best and most likely deeply contested. The same goes for other organs in our constitution. To the extent that any account of these institutional roles and the relationship between different bodies can be found within our constitution, it is likely to be partial at best and most likely deeply contested. The same goes, of course, for other organs of government apart from the House of Lords. In other words, our constitution establishes different loci of power, different centres of power, like the Houses of Parliament, the Executive and the Courts, but it does not order or systematise the relationship between these different loci. And each of these loci of power is almost completely free to develop its own justificatory narratives accounting for the existence of its power and the proper limits on that power without reference to the accounts of the other power centres. Professor David Feldman of Cambridge University, clearly more of an optimist than me, defines the constitution in terms of the processes through which such different accounts are worked out. The constitution, he says, can best be seen as the machinery through which we give authority to choose between and accommodate conflicts between different visions, rather than a set of settled rules. Now, I actually sympathise quite a lot with this way of seeing the constitution, but it follows that the UK's constitution is more dependent than most on informal institutions to function effectively. This, in turn, depends on an unusually high degree of consensus and goodwill between different constitutional actors. But what happens when this goodwill runs out? This connects with what I said about informal institutions in the video, what are constitutional conventions? And again, this phenomenon is most obvious and most easily seen in times of political crisis, such as over Brexit but it also affects the efficacy of our governing institutions in less extreme settings. That claim needs some unpacking, so let me explain a bit more about what I mean. The UK's constitution is pluricentric, meaning that power exists in different locations. The executive, represented by the Prime Minister, members of the Cabinet and other ministers of the Crown, is one source of power. Another is Parliament, consisting of MPs and peers. And of course, there is some overlap between members of the Executive and Parliament. And the courts also have significant powers and can potentially overturn decisions of the Executive. Unlike in other countries, our courts have no powers to overturn legislation, although they can declare an Act of Parliament to be incompatible with the Human Rights Act. A good example of the unstructured constitution in action is the prorogation case of last summer, 
You may remember that the Prime Minister advised Her Majesty to prorogue Parliament, that is, to suspend Parliament between sessions. In itself, this is all completely normal constitutional practice. But what was unusual was the length of the time of the prorogation, nearly five weeks, and the timing occurring as it did during a crucial period in Brexit negotiations. And several people, including Joanna Cherry MP, a Scottish National Party MP, went to court to try to get judgment that the prorogation was unlawful. And ultimately, she was successful. In the case of the Crown on behalf of Miller and Prime Minister, to use the name by which the case is usually cited in England, the Supreme Court ruled that the prorogation was unlawful. What is interesting about the whole episode to me is that it reels, reveals clearly the different justificatory narratives at play. The government argued, not just in court, but in Parliament and in press and in media, that the court should have no part to play in scrutinising the decision to prorogue Parliament. This power, they argued, was part of the prerogative power of Her Majesty, exercised by convention on the advice of the Prime Minister. Neither Parliament nor the courts had any legitimate role to play in controlling what the Prime Minister might or might not advise Her Majesty. Within Parliament, quite a different justificatory narrative emerged. This is not a normal prorogation, stated then Speaker of the House John Berko. He argued, it represents not just in the minds of many colleagues, but huge numbers of people outside the House, an act of executive fiat. What he was getting at was that such an unusually long prorogation would interfere with what Parliament saw as its proper role in scrutinising the executive. Within the justificatory narrative of Parliament, the House of Commons is the link with the people, and if it is prevented from scrutinising the actions of government, then the actions and decisions of government lack legitimacy. They become, as Speaker Berko put it, executive fiat, rather than democratically accountable government. Ultimately, the matter ended up in the Supreme Court, the UK's highest court, and the court held that the Prime Minister was under a legal duty in advising Her Majesty to have regard to all relevant interests, including the interests of Parliament. And the courts have a duty to give effect to the law, even in cases such as this one, where the issue was a matter of intense political controversy. It was therefore quite proper for the court to rule on the legal reach of the power of prorogation, and whether its exercise oversteps the boundaries established by constitutional principles, such as parliamentary sovereignty and responsible government. Later on in the module, we will look at the decision in more detail and the reason for the Supreme Court's decision that the prorogation was unlawful. But for now, the important thing to note is that the Supreme Court situated its decision within its own justificatory narrative, that the question of the constitutional propriety of the prorogation was at least partly a matter of law, and as such was within the capacity and within the proper role of the courts to control. Now you may think that the Supreme Court had the last word on the matter, and in a sense that is true. After the Supreme Court ruled that the prorogation was unlawful, Parliament returned, as if the prorogation had never happened. And legally speaking, it really had never happened. The articles of prorogation delivered by the Queen's commissioners were null and void, as if they had handed Parliament a blank piece of paper, in the words of Lady Hale. That the Supreme Court had the last word, at least for the time being in this case, is in a sense only due to the sequencing of moves in the constitutional game. Neither the decision of the Supreme Court nor the scholarly or political discussion that followed it did anything to reconcile these very different justificatory narratives. And while I would personally argue that there is much to applaud in the decision of the Supreme Court, it did nothing to settle the question of what is the proper role of the House of Commons, the Prime Minister and the Court. Why, other than as an accident of history, is the decision to prorogue Parliament vested, realistically speaking, in the Prime Minister, rather than in Parliament itself?
I will say just one more thing about the prorogation case, and that is about the divergence of academic views, not just at the margin, but in relation to what you might think should be basic fundamental points. Writing in the Daily Mail the day after the decision, Professor Richard Eakins of Oxford University wrote, The government has always had the power to prorogue Parliament, and it has never been for the courts to control how this power is exercised. The same week, Dr James Grant of King's London wrote in Time magazine that the decision was consistent with long-established constitutional principles, which hold that all executive powers have limits that are determined by the courts. It was an ordinary case of judicial review of executive power, albeit in extraordinary circumstances. Now, you might think that one of these distinguished writers has made a pretty basic mistake, They can't possibly both be right, and this is not just on the weight to be given to different principles or other differences of emphasis. Either the Constitution gives the courts the power to determine whether the prorogation was lawful, or it doesn't. It is almost like they are examining different constitutions, and in a sense that's exactly what they are doing, because in our unstructured constitution, Different loci of power come up not only with different justifications, but different recensions, different authoritative understandings of the Constitution. And that shall be the topic of the live lecture on Friday. In the meantime, take care.